I would have kicked the extra point and gone for overtime. And it had took a lot of guts to go for two, I gotta admit. That was an awesome game though. Congratulations to the guys that are here. I recently watched, um, it, the movie actually came out quite a while ago, uh, several years ago anyway, and I, I just caught it though for the first time, a movie called The King's Speech. I don't know if you've ever seen that before. Interesting movie. Um, it's about um, King, who would become King George VI of England. And the movie is interesting, it starts out um, with him as the Duke of York, who is um, the younger brother, so he's kind of the spare, initially. Um, and there's two brothers of King George V, or sons of King George V, um, Edward being the other one. And uh, so he is kind of, you know, not on the way to the throne, initially. But he has this horrible speech in heaven. And it, you know, the, the king wants him to take more of a role in uh, doing some of the public um, speaking roles because radio is becoming a bigger deal and needs him out there doing things. And he has this horrible stutter any time that he gets up to do anything like that. So they come and they find this man named Lionel Lowe, who they, uh, the Duke of York now starts to work with in order to try to overcome uh, the speech of Henry. They have a very rocky relationship at first, and things go on, and eventually they break off their relationship. King George V dies, and King Edward assumes the throne. Now the problem is, Edward has this relationship going on with a woman that he could not become married to and become the head of the Church of England. So he winds up because he's in love, he decides he's going to abdicate the throne and leaves. Now all of a sudden the Duke of York becomes King George VI, still has his horrible speech impediment, and starts working on his relationship again, lying low to try to overcome it. This goes on for a while as coronation is getting ready to take place, takes place in Westminster Abbey. And Lionel always treats the, the Duke, soon to be king, in a very familiar way. I think it gets under uh, the Duke of York, soon to be king uh, George VI skin a lot. Keeps calling him Bertie and all this other stuff. And they get into an argument when they're in Westminster practicing for the coronation. And Lionel does something that really upsets the soon-to-be king. He sits in a chair. It's called the Chair of St. Edward. This thing was built back in 1300. And it's been only used by those during the coronation ceremony of a monarch. That's all this chair is ever used for. And that's all that's ever supposed to sit in. This guy goes and plumps his butt down in the chair. And the soon to be George VI gets very upset, starts to yell at him. And talks to him about this particular chair and about how important it is because all the monarchs for since that time have been um, had their coronation there. And in fact, since um, Scotland and the United Kingdom had been united, Thing, this big rock that goes underneath it called the Stone of Destiny, that all the Scottish kings have been, uh, had their coronations upon. And so it's this huge symbol of power. Right? And all of this pageantry takes place associated with this chair. This is there that the king becomes anointed. It's there that the crown goes on the head and there are put the robes on, the big scepter goes in the hand, all of that takes place in this one seat. Credible image of power. Especially back in the day 
when all of that stuff mattered, right? When the kings actually had power, you know, now instead of being more or less a big set. But it still has symbolic meaning attached to it. All of that with this given chair. It's interesting that in Luke's cycle, cycle C, which we're now in the last Sunday of hearing from Luke for a while, that what's chosen for this particular Sunday, the feast of Jesus Christ, King of the universe, is actually for him, or out of this cycle, it's from the crucifixion. And I found that a very interesting choice on the part of the church that they're going to take this and use this as part of the description of what it means for Jesus to be the king of the universe. But if you think about it, all of the events that have been leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus are very much like, or it contains at least elements of a coronation. Think about when Jesus was being scourged. After that had taken place, what did they do? They put on his head a crown of thorns. What did they do when they escorted him around? They put on him a royal purple garment. They put a reed in his hand to be his royal scepter. All of these elements that are part of a coronation. But where is the throne? He isn't seated on the throne until his crucifixion, where he's mounted to the cross. The cross is the throne of Jesus, the King of the universe. Think about how much in symbology that throne means. In human kingdoms, in days gone by, Sitting upon the throne, the king would have done his judgments. People would have come to him asking for, you know, judgment over one person or another, or he would have prescribed acquittals or sentences of death. Whatever the king chose to do, the instrument of his power is the throne. And from here, we hear Jesus make his one pronouncement of judgment. The two thieves have a conversation with Jesus as he is hanging upon his throne that is the cross. The one asking, if you are the Son of God, the Anointed One, the Messiah, the Christ, take us down and yourself too. Interestingly enough, Jesus does not respond to him. The thief essentially condemns himself. But the other then speaks up and says, We are guilty of our crimes, but this man has done nothing to deserve his. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus passes the one judgment. Surely this day you will be with me in paradise. All the elements of what kingly power on earth would look like exist in this moment of Jesus hanging on the cross. And his death means so much more. So much more power is invested in that moment than any king would have on earth. Because Jesus opens with that very death the gates of paradise, his eternal kingdom. The only thing we need to do is to be like the other thief. Cry out to him, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The other one was too caught up in his own, in his own struggles, his own concerns in life, that even at the edge of death, he was thinking only of himself. But the one who knew of his guilt 
turned to Jesus and asked him to remember him when he went into his kingdom. That is the price of entrance. To acknowledge our wrongfulness and to ask for God's mercy. Jesus sits in judgment on his throne, willing, wanting to forgive us. We just need to ask him to remember.